Hello, my name is Russell Swanson, and this is a lecture in my series on the history of ethics that will deal primarily with the rise of the modern era in ethics. Um, and in particular, what I'm hoping to develop in this lecture is kind of a good news, bad news story about the rise of uh, the modern era and how it impacts the history of ethics. Um, so look and listen carefully for the idea that I call the modern crisis in ethics, because that's one of the main ideas that I want to develop today. And so let me drop back and put this into a slightly larger context here. In the history of Western civilization, there have been at least three major eras um, since the Axial Age Revolution about 2,500 years ago. So historians call roughly the first thousand years of the last 2,500 uh, the ancient age. And then we have about a thousand years roughly, you know, these are big broad numbers that are just helpful for sort of framing ideas. The next thousand years will be the medieval era. And then maybe we can say for, the, for our purposes today, that um, the last 500 years have been the modern era, although there will be a debate about whether or not we've gone beyond the modern into something called the postmodern, and we'll deal with that later in the lecture series. However, I wanted to make the point that as today we're focusing on the rise of the modern, in some sense what you can see here is, is kind of a, a pendulum swing in history going on in these three major era, eras of Western civilization, the ancient and the medieval and the modern. We might even connect this to the idea of a dialectical movement in the history of ideas. But basically the idea, the, the claim I want to make is this, that what defines the ancient era and Western civilization and frankly, the moment that's called by historians the Axial Age Revolution 20, 2,500 years ago is a major shift in human culture in which age-old patterns of thinking about reality and thinking about human life give way to something different. And around the Mediterranean, which gives rise to the uh, Western tradition of civilization, we're going to see the emergence of what I'll call the philosophical uh, experiment, right? The, the idea that certain cultures will um, tolerate a certain number of individuals uh, for thinking radically and critically about the cultural lens that dominates that society at that time, right? So maybe the philosophical experiment of Greece and Rome, we could say it like this, I always sort of half joke about it like this, is a period of time in which you won't always be killed for offering a powerful critique of the culture in which you live. And that experiment, you know, really flourishes as we've developed in Greek thought, and then that continues in Roman thought. But it seems to kind of collapse with Rome's collapse around, let's say, 500 years after zero. And so what we'll see from that point on in the medieval era, comprised of two halves, the early Middle Ages and the, and the late Middle Ages, is the collapse, large, largely the disappearance of the philosophical experiment of the ancient world. There will be philosophy and thought that transpires in the medieval, some amazing thought, but it will be highly, highly constrained by the religious lens of culture around the Mediterranean in this thousand year period. Again, nice broad numbers that we're using here. And in the early Middle Ages, as we've seen in previous lectures, we'll get kind of a simple approach to morality that philosophers characterize as the divine command theory approach. And in the late Middle Ages, particularly by the time we get to Aquinas in the 13th century, we're going to see that kind of scriptural, simple scriptural approach to morality uh, begin to show itself uh, evolving into something a little bit more philosophically nuanced in the form of the natural law theory of morality. And that foreshadows the rise of the modern. Because what we see in the late Middle Ages with the development of the natural law theory of morality is we see how the reemergence of the Greek and Roman philosophical experiment in the late Middle Ages begins to reshape even religious thought. And particularly the way that it reshapes religious thought is for somebody like Aquinas, it causes him to create a kind of a synthesis of the life of faith and the life of reason. 
the life of religion and the life of philosophy. The late Middle Ages sees the beginning, right, of what's coming in the modern, which is the return of the full-on philosophical experiment. And in many ways, if I were to sort of put this, you know, to, to a single factor, and, and anytime that happens, you know, it's an oversimplification, but for symbolic purposes, it can be useful for thought to understand that the rise of the modern in many ways is shaped by the rise of science, okay? And the rise of science as a methodology and all of the theories that come out of that methodology have been influenced by the rediscovery and reemergence of Greek and Roman philosophy. In particular, as we developed in, our, in the lecture on natural law theory, the rediscovery of Aristotelian naturalism really influences Aquinas and does its part to influence and renew an interest in the systematic study of the natural world. And this, along with a lot of other complicated factors, including somewhat of an economic boom that occurs within particularly certain port city states and what we would think of as Italy these days, leads to, uh, contributes to the emergence of the Renaissance. And so for our purposes, one of the ways I like to talk about the Renaissance, which as you well know is, uh, you know, a word meaning the rebirth, is, is sort of ask yourself a question, you know, what is reborn in the Renaissance? And I think the way that we're educated on this many times has led us to believe that what's reborn in the Renaissance is art. And that's true, but I think in many ways the art of the Renaissance that is reborn from the ancient, right? reflects the deeper philosophical experiment of the ancient being reborn in the late Middle Ages and then beginning to really flourish by, by the time you get to the 15th and 16th century and what we think of as the Italian Renaissance. And so Renaissance art, you know, as opposed to, let's say, medieval art, changes its focus, you know, and one way to think about this different, changes its focus from using art to tell biblical narratives to using art to focus back on the human form. And one of the reasons why I think we're starting to see this transformation of art in the Renaissance is that there's a transformation going on in the late Middle Ages that blossoms into the modern age, a transformation centering around our attitudes towards ourselves. Because as the philosophical experiment of the ancient is reborn in the late Middle Ages and then blossoms into something like science in the modern age, roughly again around 1500 in the middle of the Renaissance, expanding out into the enlightenment of Western culture, we're going to see a return to a kind of a, a willingness to celebrate our human abilities. Remember, we talked about humanism in a much earlier lecture in this series, particularly in my lecture on Taoism, when I contrasted Taoism with Confucian philosophy. And I talked about Confucian philosophy as a form of humanism. And by that, I'm gonna mean roughly the same thing in this lecture. And that is humanism is, the, uh, is built on the uh, belief that the human being is not broken and fallen uh, but more it, it is a creature that has certain abilities. I like to refer to them as the capacities for observing and for thinking, right? For observation and reasoning that can make a meaningful impact on improving the quality of life. And I'm going to argue that that's what's essential to humanism. That's a, what was a part of the philosophical experiment of the ancient that now will be reborn and expanded and be definitive of, in many ways, what happens in the modern era. And so what I'm developing for you here is kind of the good news side of the story of the emergence in science and the rise of the modern era. But I'm gonna tell you kind of an intellectually subtle story about the rise of the modern, because it is a story with at least sort of two sides to it. Um, it's gonna have a good news side to it, which I'm gonna develop here first, but then it's going to have a kind of a bad news size to, side to it as well, particularly in relation to our philosophies and uh, our ethical philosopher, uh, philosophies uh, especially. And I'm going to refer to that by the end of lecture as the modern crisis in ethics.
And so again, what I've developed for you so far is sort of a larger context for understanding the rise of the modern. I've developed for you a little bit of a recap of how what happens in the late Middle Ages is going to foreshadow uh, uh, something that is definitive of the rise of the modern, and that's the development of a kind of a more, even more systematic way of studying the natural world, and that science, to put some uh, sort of a single word on it, is going to be, you know, a really good news story for humans in many, many respects, but there's going to be kind of a dark side to the rise of science, particularly in relation to the history of ethics, which this lecture series focuses on. But let me go ahead, and as I promised, and develop for you a little bit more about the good news story that emerges with regard to the uh, emergence of science. Um, the most obvious thing that you could have uh, sort of guessed for yourself about the good news side of the story here is that this methodology of science, which is sort of born out of, you know, observations and the formation of hypotheses and then the attempt to develop certain patterns of observation, maybe even experimentation that would develop um, evidence for uh, or primarily, or more importantly, evidence that might uh, show our hypothesis to be wrong, and if we fail to find evidence that shows our hypothesis to be wrong, if we find evidence that suggests our hypothesis is perhaps still right, then we might eventually use certain things like the printing press, which is also related to the rise of the modern era and the spread of science. It developed much earlier in the Far East, but, you know, developed in roughly the 15th century in the West, you know, we're going to see the, the way in which some individual person can make some observations, develop a hypothesis, uh, create further observations, maybe based on sort of experimental controls, and then eventually be able to maybe publish those findings amongst a community of people who are going to then try to challenge and break down these findings. And if they can't, then maybe we're getting somewhere. And through the community approach that science generates, which is very much an expansion of Philia Sophia, as we've developed it in this, this lecture series, that original sort of platonic notion of a community of people seeking wisdom together by challenging each other's thoughts in charitable ways and constructive ways. This is going to just be put on steroids in the form of the scientific community using this methodology to generate the most powerful theories of reality that we've ever come up with. And that's sort of number one in terms of good news about the rise of science is that human beings are going to generate the most effective, most powerful theories of reality that we've ever come up with thus far, you know, giving rise to fields like physics and chemistry and biology, giving rise to, you know, incredibly powerful new technologies over the next few centuries. You know, in, in many respects, the physics of the 17th century is going to allow us, you know, once you combine certain you know, later developments in, in rocket technology, for example, you know, but that physics of the 17th century is going to be enough to get us, you know, to the moon and Mars. Very powerful theories of physics, very powerful theories of chemistry and biology, eventually leading to our understanding of our place within the larger biological sphere through the 19th century advancements into what we think of today as evolutionary biology, and all of the myriad technologies that are brought about through like, let's say, thermodynamics and the steam engine and medicines and just so many things to this moment, even this ability to record this lecture, all brought to you by our enriched understanding of the nature of reality and how it appears to be functioning brought to you by the rise of science. And so incredible good news, part of the story right there. But let's add a kind of a deeper point as we do a, maybe a little bit of philosophical thinking about the rise of science and some of the epistemological or epistemic implications of this methodology. And here what I want to emphasize is the way in which the rise of science is going to contribute more than anything to the rebirth of ancient humanism and even what we might call here uh, the reborn idea of individualism. 
And what I mean here, right, by humanism, again, is a sort of a belief in ourselves. And here I've introduced this idea of individualism, a sort of a reborn ancient idea that will be expanded in the modern and become really crucial in the modern, which is not only do we believe in our human abilities, what, what, but we believe that you can be any person, right? I mean, at, of course, at first, this is gonna be dominated by men. It's gonna be dominated by men of certain ethnicities. It's gonna be dominated by men with certain economic opportunities. But throughout the modern, more and more what we're gonna see is that fundamentally what seems possible to, to, uh, to comprehend via a, a philosophical reflection upon the scientific method is you don't have to be a man to do it. You don't have to be of a certain ethnicity to do it. Uh, you know, you, you do need, you know, we, what Aristotle might have called some external goods, you know, to have the opportunity to engage in scientific thinking does require some economic um, opportunities, but more and more throughout the modern, we'll see that won't be re, uh, reserved for the elite classes. More and more, that'll be something that is taught, you know, in, let's say in the 20th century in public school settings to just about anybody who can get a free public education in certain parts of the world are going to be taught about scientific methodologies. And the point there, right, is that what we're going to realize throughout the modern more and more is that anybody can do science if you're given the right opportunities. And if anybody can do science, then any individual human is a place where truth, important, meaningful, life-changing truths can be discovered. And so an important part of the transition from the medieval to the modern is gonna be the, trans, the, 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 the moving away of a reliance upon religious authorities and, and, and kings and queens in civil society for our understanding of the world. And what we'll see on the rise and expanding throughout the modern is this idea that we don't need to turn to religious and civil authorities for our understanding. We can, if we have certain key economic and educational opportunities, we can each discover wisdom and knowledge about life for ourselves. And in many respects, right, like this scientific revolution, besides yielding knowledge, is, is, under, is the foundation upon which is built the modern celebration of human abilities and the value and dignity of the human individual. And so this is going to undergird, again, a rebirth and an expansion of some ancient ideas that were about rights. And in particular, you'll recognize uh, this important modern moral concept of the notion of the universal human right. And what I'm arguing here is that the very notion that there is an inherent dignity to being a human individual is very much tied to this idea that the human individual, if this is an individual like an acorn that falls in the right soil, is, the, is potentially a, a, a place um, where truth can be discovered. I, I, you know, forgive me for that acorn you know, kind of reference there. That's, this is me sort of hearkening back to Aristotle and, a, and, a, and an analogy that Aristotle uses as his way of developing, you know, sort of actualizing potential. Um, and of course, the acorn by itself has the potential to become the oak tree, but it has to fall in, into certain kind of conditions. And that's true of the human being. If the human being is, as Aristotle argued, fortunate enough to have certain external goods met during its, especially its formative years, then the human being develops into a creature that has the capacity to observe and reason about life in ways that can make all the difference in terms of quality of life for humans generally and societies generally and for the human individual. And what I'm doing here is connecting these deeper philosophical points about the rise of science to the, the, uh, the 17th and 18th century reemergence, rebirth, renaissance, and expansion of the idea of rights of individuals into this idea of the universal human right. And then let's see how, you know, let's just make a quick connection here that's still very powerful, that even the idea of 
uh, um, the, the government getting its authority not from God, but from the consent of the governed, right, is tied to this philosophical rebirth and all that I've been describing here. And so the idea of parliaments, the idea of the social contract, and the rebirth of democracy itself in the modern age in the 18th century is going to be tied to the rebirth of this philosophical experiment in the Italian Renaissance, which spreads out through the modern era in Western civilization in the form of the Enlightenment. And so this, again, is a good news story, not just in terms, about, uh, in terms of the power of the knowledge that will be produced over these centuries from the 15th century onward, but it's also going to be behind or undergird a kind of a moral uh, revolution of sorts in the expansion of the notion um, and the spreading of the notion of the, of the fundamental human right and the spreading of the revolutionary ideas of, of social contracts and consent of the governed and democracy itself, which is very much going to lead to an, uh, um, an era that I think historians of political philosophy call the age of revolution, which is sort of the global uh, spread of these ideas into literal revolutions you know, like the Haitian Revolution and the Irish Revolution and the English Civil War and the American Revolution and the French Revolution and, and so many of the Greek Revolution and so many others, many that will succeed and many that will fail. But all of this radical societal change in many ways, I'm saying, is brought to you by this pendulum swing of history in which the ancient philosophical uh, experiment which is largely suppressed and lost for the roughly thousand years of the medieval period is reborn yes foreshadowed in the late middle ages but reborn and definitive of the modern era in western civilization and so you know this is going to lead to important you know english and english influenced uh, American thinkers like John Locke, you know, who in the 17th century is going to argue for the idea of basic human rights that are sort of uh, God-given rights that are sort of built right into the fabric of reality, built right into us, and then we create governments in some sense, right, to protect in some sense these natural god-given rights and the way in which the very recognizable name of thomas jefferson right who's such an important writer in many of the early foundational documents of american political philosophy particularly let's focus on that famous line very early in the declaration of independence ironically when the american colonies break with english monarchy uh, which, Jeff which John Locke had resisted, you know, in the 17th century. Uh, Jefferson's going to write, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, and yes, men is still the language there, and patriarchy is still dominant, and that explains a lot of why we're still talking about a lot of men in the history of ethics, but that will change in part due to these revolutionary new ideas as they expand throughout the modern. But Jefferson writes in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are the rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And then he goes on to say, and that's why we form governments, right? To ensure these rights. And uh, the government itself gets its authority from the consent of the governed. The consent of the who? The consent of the individuals, right? Now, the one thing I want to develop for you, and this is where I'm going to start to foreshadow for you the way in which there's sort of a dark side or a bad news side uh, of the rise of science in the modern age, particularly with regard to ethics and morality and values in the modern age, is that maybe if you're really on your game here, you know, these ideas will be recognizable, but if you followed me in the thinking of this lecture series, and in particular, if you listen to maybe the last lecture on natural law, that you should hear in Locke's language from the 17th century that's echoed in Jefferson's language. You know, Locke originally had said there's three primary God-given rights, life, liberty, and private property, you know, which he does, you know, have limits 
around, which I, you know, the lock-in proviso is often ignored there, but then Jefferson turns that into life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which by the way, Jefferson's, you know, I think very much influenced by Greek philosophical considerations as to why he takes out property and puts in pursuit of happiness. And pursuit of happiness is thought to be sort of much more noble and much more expansive than just the right to own some stuff. But Jefferson is definitely building on Locke as he defines sort of the foundational ideas uh, uh, for the American political philosophy. But you should hear in this not only revolution, revolutionary new modern ideas, you should also, if you're on your game, hear the way in which Locke and Jefferson seem to have kind of a foot in the modern and still a foot in the medieval, i.e. a foot in the natural law theory of morality in particular. You know, Jefferson says we hold these truths to be self-evident that, that uh, you know, that all men are created equal and that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Okay, there is the echo, right, of the natural law theory of morality, that at its heart, morality is the creation of God, and that we can study the natural world to see these self-evident, just obvious truths facts, moral facts, built into the structure of reality that serve as the moral foundation for the construction of our political philosophies. And so while consent of the govern and democracy, you know, are, you know, very much ancient ideas, reborn and definitive of the modern and revolutionary in the modern in terms of the way they are expanded, there is at the foundation of these modern revolutionary ideas still some what I would call medieval ideas, namely the natural law theory, which, and I argued in my last lecture that natural law theory will not be philosophically all that uh, prevalent, and I'm going to develop for you why that's the case in this lecture, but here I'm also sort of reiterating how natural law theory is culturally uh, really influential still throughout the modern, and that that's going to create a kind of a tension. Again, at the end of my last lecture on natural law theory itself, I, I developed for you one of the reasons why natural law theory is not going to be that prevalent philosophically, and I began to develop for you this idea of the sort of separation of the ideas of the facts that are generated by an understanding of science and the values which, when we look at the world through the lens of science, are not that obvious. And so in some ways this is me foreshadowing where this is going because as science continues to develop, yes we'll see culturally in terms of political philosophy and cultural uh, culture more broadly, we'll see the expansion and experimentation of these ideas, moral concepts like human rights, but if I foreshadow where this is going in terms of the crisis, the more we dig into the scientific worldview, the less evidence we're going to find for something like the self-evident truths of our God-given human rights. As the more we study ourselves biologically and physiologically, the more you're going to understand, you know, how hair grows and, you know, how eyes process light into electrical signals for the brain. But where are our natural rights? Okay, but I'm getting ahead of myself here uh, in foreshadowing this sort of bad news part of the story. Let me continue just for a moment more with a kind of a symbolic moment from the early modern to develop this good news side of the story that then also sort of bleeds over into a bad news side of the story. And so the symbolic moment I wanna pull uh, out of history to use to develop these ideas here is the Reformation um, of Martin Luther, the reformation of Christian theology from the early 16th century uh, attributed to Martin Luther. Um, now, many of you have heard of Martin Luther, and maybe you've heard the probably apocryphal story of the 95 theses that were nailed onto the church door which may sound, you know, like more radical than, than it was. You, you did, I think, at that time, nail certain key documents onto the wooden doors of a church, that that was a kind of a public space for doing that. 
But that story of the, na the nailing uh, of the 95 Theses to the church door, most scholars agree, probably an apocryphal story, probably didn't happen. But in many ways, I think it's still kind of a fair symbolic rendering of how a more complicated set of writings came to put Martin Luther at odds with the Catholic Church. And, you know, I'm going to give you kind of a simple version of this story. Uh, and let me just say, Martin Luther was, uh, you know, a genius in many ways, but he's also, uh, again, a kind of an interesting symbol of good news, bad news, and the rise of the modern. I mean, Luther was famously anti-Semitic and very, you know, sort of very sort of harsh in his critique of, of, um, of Judaism and Jews, which is pretty particularly ironic when you look at the larger history of how Christianity emerges out of Judaism. But also perhaps there you get a sort of an understanding of uh, a lot of the conspiratorial teachings about uh, about Judaism, uh, because as Christianity breaks out of the Jewish context, you know, there's this sort of tendency to oversimplify the demise of Jesus at the hands of of the of um, the the Roman backed Jewish or Jewish orthodoxy at the time, and so you know, you're going to get in Luther, and you're going to get even to this day a kind of a a, a really um, I would say uninformed conspiratorial condemnation of Judaism that's more than unfortunate and is, you know, immoral in many of its manifestations. And Luther is no exception. But on the other hand, you know, Luther is a radical theologian who does something pretty interesting and powerful. In particular, in the early 16th century, Luther was highly critical of the practice of indulgences on the part of the Catholic Church. And you probably heard of this, but I'll spell it out for you anyway, which is that, you know, there was this practice and this kind of institution that had developed within Catholicism of like literally selling reduced sentences in the afterlife, you know, like re selling forgiveness. Like if you give enough to the priest class and the church, you can spend less time in purgatory and, and have your sentence sort of reduced and, the, and your sins sort of forgiven. Now, what, however charitable you want to be, you can see how that would be sort of ripe for corruption. And Luther is going to, I think, rightly condemn the practice as morally suspect and theologically suspect. And he's going to get himself into even more trouble by, you know, saying, you know, how the Pope is richer than the richest pagan Roman ever had been. And, you know, why is the Pope not paying for the building of churches? Why are we taxing, you know, poor people and selling and, you know, forgiveness in order to build churches and to build the, the incredible structures of the Vatican itself. And obviously, eventually, that's not going to, you know, help Luther in his, um, in his literal trials um, for heresy in Rome. Um, eventually, Luther will have the protection of certain key uh, princes in Northern Europe, uh, and, but he will be excommunicated, and um, I think that excommunication in roughly 1521 or so is going to stand for centuries, if not to this day. Um, uh, and so along with the condemnation that Luther offered of indulgences, you know, Luther, um, and, and that his writings crit critiquing the Catholic Church, centering on the critique of indulgences is what led to this idea of the 95 Theses and the apocryphal story about that sort of you know, nailing this to the church door as a major protest, giving rise to, importantly, right, the, the form of protest-based Christianity, which will then go on to, you know, move forward in history as a continued set of protests over time, uh, forming many different types of protestant, protestant Christianity. Uh, that's actually important for understanding how this what I'm going to celebrate here in a moment uh, in terms of the accomplishments of Luther that generate religious freedom uh, or will contribute to the, uh, the celebration and continued expansions of notions of religious freedom in the modern age is also going to be foreshadowing of the bad news side of the story as 
religious traditions and interpretations of religious scriptural traditions will over time generally fragment in the ways that I'm describing to you here within the Christian tradition and the Catholic tradition in particular. So famously, Luther also writes um, that every man, and again, there's that you know, sort of echo of patriarchy that's still very much alive in this early modern, um, but that if we, you know, very charitably, you know, reinterpret that, that every person eventually, right, can be his or her own priest. And that was a radical idea because in many respects, the Catholic Church had set itself up to be the number one, of course, interpreter of scripture and scriptures written in Latin and only the priests really are good at reading Latin. And the church is there and is a kind of a required mediator for you in your relationship with God. And this is another thing that Luther is suspect of and criticizes. In some sense, he's boldly saying that we don't need a particular religious institution to mediate our relationship with God. And so, you know, if, if the 95 theses, you know, roughly emerge around 1517 by I think maybe 1522 or so, Luther will have his own version of the Bible, which he'll translate uh, into German. And particularly the, the sort of version of German that Luther's going to translate the Bible into is a very commonly used version of German. Now, a lot of people are still not literate at this time in history in this part of the world, but more people will be have access to hearing and reading the Bible in German than would have uh, had access to hearing and reading uh, the Bible in Latin, right? So the, the move here is this radical move that in many ways is consistent with what we've talked about so far in terms of the rise of the modern, that the human individual, even within <clears throat> religious circles, is going to be moved from the margin to kind of echo some language from the philosopher bell hooks from margin to center right is that the human individual is going to be increasingly put at the center of the discovery of truth even <clears throat> in terms of the interpretation of scripture even within religious institutions and then this movement generally is going to be increasingly codified and codified into the democratic revolutions of the 18th century in terms of sort of a human right to religious freedom, which will <clears throat> eventually include the freedom to not believe, uh, not for a long time really, but <clears throat> excuse me, at least on paper, <clears throat> this will be the right to, to, to non-belief or the right to your own interpretation and to your own practices. And so in many ways, I'm saying that Luther's reforming, Luther's reformation uh, based in his protest, giving rise to Lutheran Protestant protest-based Christianity will be a kind of a movement towards an expansion of religious freedom in the modern, and I'm gonna associate that with the good news. But let's also talk about how this is going to increasingly present a problem in the history of ethics, because, and this is generally true of all the scriptural traditions, over time we're going to see a movement towards religious fragmentation. Uh, and splitting into all different versions based on different interpretations of a particular scripture. And while this is good in terms of maybe the freedom of individuals to think for themselves, keep in mind that in many respects, morality is that subset of culture that really glues us together. Let me say that another way because this is a big and important idea that morality largely connected, especially throughout the medieval period, to religion itself is that subset of culture that really glues us together into large cooperative societies that facilitate cooperation. And so religious fragmentation from monolithic institutions like the Catholic Church into, you know, um, and from this idea of being Catholic or universal to many different varieties to this day, increasing sort of 
splitting and fragmentation, protests against monolithic institutions like Catholicism into all these myriad different institutions in the modern age, increasingly within the 20th and 21st century, increasingly seen as an individual experience, right? Like that's what we're seeing sociologically within the, within the 20th century, is people are breaking even from institutions to see religion as an increasingly individual experience. And yes, good news in terms of freedom of thought, but let's also recognize that religious institutions and common forms of religious belief used to glue them, glue the 50,000 individuals into the cooperative society, right? By giving them the rules of conduct that would make such amazingly complex economies possible. And this is also going to foreshadow the modern crisis in ethics. And so now I would like to uh, move beyond sort of foreshadowing the modern crisis of ethics. Now I'd like to develop for you kind of the bad news side of the story in terms of the rise of science in the modern age. <clears throat> and the bad news side of the story, I guess we could start again as we did with the good news side of the story. You know, knowledge is power. And I, I, I spun that as kind of the good news side of the story. And I, I think that it definitely is. I wouldn't want to do away with our scientific understanding of the world and all that that has brought for us. But, but let's also just go ahead and say out loud that when we talk about all that scientific understanding has brought to us, we're not just talking about antibiotics and the procedures and modeling techniques that are going to allow us to more quickly generate, um, you know, vaccines to fight viruses in the 21st century. We're also talking about the generation of nuclear power, both for good and for bombs, right? We're, we're talking about not only a deeper understanding of how we might fight viruses and bacterial infections, um, we're talking about the knowledge that will also allow some people uh, to generate, right, uh, biological forms of warfare. And so knowledge itself, right, while I cast it sort of simplistically as a good news part of the story, knowledge is really more sort of a neutral part of the story. Again, I would never want to do away with scientific understanding. I'm not a Luddite. I'm not against modern technology. I'm certainly not for sort of freezing progress in terms of scientific understanding. But I am going to develop for you a little bit of, of the reasons why in the modern and particularly the late modern, maybe postmodern 19th, 20th century, we're going to come to this realization that, you know, scientific understanding in and of itself is neutral. And what really matters is what we do with it. And what's going to dictate what we do with it is going to be the value systems of our societies and the value systems of individuals. And so this is going to make us understanding the kind of the modern crisis in ethics all that more important. And so I want to flesh out for you this idea of a bad news side of the story even more. I want to flesh out uh, for you this idea of the modern crisis in ethics by talking to you again about how ethics is often informed by metaphysics. And as science and as a methodology produces increasingly powerful theories of physics and chemistry and biology, and we turn these into increasingly coherent pictures of reality, the early modern period is going to see this as developing a picture of reality that we might call um, a mechanistic materialism. And that means that early modern science is going to feed this idea, again, a reborn ancient idea, that reality is material or physical, and that this is be the sort of modern spin on that, that in some sense, this gigantic physical universe works according to certain natural laws, like a big machine. And that the goal of science is to understand the natural laws of the big physical machine. But as we begin to unpack what I'm calling here the sort of metaphysics of early modern science, I want to emphasize the materialism. 
because as I emphasize the materialism, that should do two things for you, especially if you've been following me in this lecture series. One, this ought to explain why hedonism doesn't sound like crazy talk in the modern, right? Because their metaphysics were materialistic. And so hedonism as a theory of how to get the most out of life doesn't sound like crazy talk, might sound a little selfish to people in the modern. Let me go ahead and develop that for a second because it's worth developing. Um, you know, in the modern, we have inherited the idea of ethics from the medieval. And so the main question that we, we've inherited about ethics in the medieval, right, is how do I deserve to be good enough, right? Like, how can I be good enough to deserve my supernatural reward? And so this is going to transform into the question of modern ethics, which is how can I be a good person? And so we've inherited that question from the medieval. Of course, this is going to funnel right into the modern crisis in the sense that it's no longer going to be tied to that supernatural metaphysics of the medieval. But on the other hand, let's get back to, to hedonism and how hedonism is going to sound to a modern ear in light of the rise of modern science. Um, it's going to sound reasonable because it's based in a materialist metaphysics but it's going to sound selfish because it sounds like it's just about you. And it's right that it's just about you, but it's not fair to call it selfish for that reason. It's in some sense, hedonism is just about you because ancient ethics was about how you can get the most out of life. And so hedonist ethical philosophy is answering that question that question or the question of ethics that is central will be transformed by the collapse of the ancient and the collapse of Rome and the rise and the return of religion in the medieval and the emergence of this question of how can I deserve my supernatural reward, which is going to transform into this question of how can I be a good person. And so when we hear ethics in the modern, we think of morals. And so when we hear hedonism, we think, yeah, reasonable, why? Because the modern is so informed by materialism, but a little selfish, why? Because the modern is so informed by this question of how can I be a good person, which primarily isn't how do I get the most, how do I get the most out of life? It's focused on how do I need to treat other people in order to be considered a good person? And so hedonism is gonna seem a little self-focused. Uh, you know, again, I think that's uncharitable as a critique of hedonism because hedonism was answering the ancient question. And keep in mind that even somebody like Epicurus would have said you should be kind to other people for the simple reason that kindness often begets kindness and kindness often leads to more, you know, sort of loving societies, certainly groups and communities, and that's where you're going to enjoy your life more. Okay, that was a little ta tangent as to, uh, to that I take in here to say why in the modern age hedonism is going to be still very culturally prevalent and sound even philosophically like it's very reasonable because it's grounded in this materialist metaphysics. But now, now let me go back to this point of developing early modern metaphysics as a kind of a mechanistic materialism in which we use the methodology of science to seek out the natural laws of the of the of the universe right but the materialism here is going to uh, lead us to discount the possibility that we can find moral laws right and here's me beginning to spell out the modern crisis in ethics the more we turn to science for our picture of reality and this will be what happens to a lot of really well-informed, well-educated thinkers like Thomas Hobbes and David Hume and Immanuel Kant and Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, throughout the modern, these really thoughtful, well-informed, well-educated thinkers are going to see the problem here. The more we rely on this mechanistic materialism as our underlying metaphysical conception of the nature of reality, the less we can turn to reality itself for our understanding of morality. In fact, let me put it to you like this and sort of develop the same point in a number of different ways. The more we understand the material facts, 
the less we're going to see evidence of the values. And this is going to lead, especially thinkers like Thomas Hobbes, to the realization that there's kind of a, a conundrum of sorts, kind of a, a mystery of sorts to be dealt with in the modern age, which is the more we study the reality, more, the more we study reality, right? <laughs> Forgive me for that. Um, the more we study reality, the more we're going to see that reality is made up of physical facts that will be more powerful for us than ever. But this mechanistic materialist conception of reality won't show us the values, as I just said, but yet we see humans in every culture throughout history, known history, talking about, you know, being good and sort of differentiating right behaviors from wrong behaviors and condemning certain behaviors as wrong and championing other behaviors as right. Where does that come from? If reality itself is material, where do our beliefs about values, specifically moral values about right and wrong, even come from? And, you know, there's sort of a, an obvious answer here, and the obvious answer is that values come from us, that somehow values are the creation of humans, and that, you know, in some ways we can use the hedonist again here, that the very idea of good and bad come into reality because some creatures are physiologically complex enough to mysteriously experience their reality as sentient beings, and because they experience their reality as sentient beings, they have pleasant and unpleasant experiences, which is going to be the sort of natural basis for the emergence of concepts in conceptualizing sentient creatures of good and bad. And so again, we can build on this now and expand on hedonism, right, to say, well, thinkers who are inheriting the medieval question of ethics of how do I deserve my supernatural reward and simply spun to the question of modern ethics is how can I be a good person and how can we understand moral goodness at all? Well, you know, the simple answer is, well, somehow we need to be able to explain how humans construct morality. How do humans construct our concepts of moral right and wrong? But the problem with this kind of obvious direction is that it's going to lead to what I'm going to call some very unhelpful ideas. Tempting, but unhelpful that we're going to deal with a little bit in a couple of more lectures. And that is that morality is constructed by humans, either human individuals, and human individuals are going to construct their own perspectives, and every perspective is going to be equally valuable, and so moral claims are going to be completely relative to individual perspective. That's going to sound very familiar. I'm giving you the philosophical background as to why that's going to sound really familiar and why that's going to resonate with many of you. Um, but I just want to begin to foreshadow for you that while that's a very tempting line of thought, if morality is ultimately only reducible to individual subjective perspectives, then there's really nothing else to talk about. And Jeffrey Dahmer's morality is completely equal in terms of validity to yours. And if you're comfortable with that, well, I guess then you can go with individual level relativism as a reasonable theory of morality. I'm going to try to argue and convince you that that in, in the tradition of Socrates, we should not be satisfied with a claim that we have arrived at wisdom about values when we equate Jeffrey Dahmer's personal moral value system with yours, right? You know, who, who, whoever I'm speaking to here, you know, you are likely not the kind of person that thinks it's a good idea to eat the other humans, right? You know, and let's you you know use some low hanging fruit here. You know, uh, you know, is your value structure the same as Adolf Hitler's? You know, and Pol Pot's. You know, I mean, how many individuals new do we need to listen? And there's another analogous line of thought that we could develop here. That in some sense, this line of thought that somehow 
if, if the nature of reality is material, uh, it is mechanistic materialism, if that's our underlying metaphysics throughout the early modern period as informed by science, you know, that that's going to make any kind of natural morality kind of a, a mystery. And so it's going to lead us to think that humans construct morality, which is going to lead us to, as I've developed this idea, that maybe it's individually relative, or maybe there are these groups of humans that have constructed stories over time called cultures, and that all moralities are merely relative to some cultural tradition. And this is the idea of cultural relativism. Again, the same line of thought, I think, um, applies here. It's, if that sounds tempting to you, I, I think I've tried to develop for you today the reasons why in the modern age, especially 21st century, we've arrived at this place where cultural relativism is a very tempting position. But most people who adhere to or think they adhere to cultural relativism really just don't understand the implications of cultural relativism yet. And namely, again, that is that if we, if we accept cultural relativism, then whatever strange interpretation, and I would call it just this bizarre interpretation of Islam that we see in the form of, um, you know, the ISIS movement in the Middle East, are the value structures within the parts of, of uh, Iraq controlled by ISIS, you know, or recently, until recently, controlled by ISIS, are, are those value structures as moral and as equal, you know, equally valid morally as, you know, let's say the value structure that undergirds, at least ideally, undergirds American society? And this is not me overly simply championing American society. I mean, I know certainly American history is rife with things that we should be critical of, but let's also give the American experiment its due. You know, I mean, the idea of democracy 2.0, at least in theory, right? Like this is what's wrong with police killing an, a, a person they don't know to be guilty for something that they don't know they did, right? without any due process, right, in the moment, you know, pre and again, this is not me over simply condemning all police action, right, but this is, this is me just saying, you know, when we see this debate in modern American culture about something like police brutality, which, you know, let's champion law enforcement, let's champion many of the laws, let's champion many of the philosophical, you know, underpinnings of American society, while at the same time being able to call out, you know, instances, 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 instances of completely unacceptable abuse of power leading to violence. And it's especially ironic when the very people that are supposedly committing their lives to protecting our rights, when some small subset of them, uh, you know, engages in behaviors that, that take our rights, including our life from us, you know, what are we, you know, what are we complaining about? Well, we're complaining about the way in which some subsets of people within society are not recognizing the fact that that the ideals undergirding American society are noble and that we have this imperfect history of implementing them, but that doesn't take away from the nobility of the ideals and the ongoing attempt, which is I think what's behind many protests in contemporary American society of police brutality, right? Is this in some ways is a championing of the American experiment and an ongoing attempt to see its ideals expand and be implemented in a more consistent fashion, right? But let's recognize that this is a critique of cultural relativism, right? All this is a critique of cultural relativism. Um, in many respects, this is us trying to say that not all cultures are morally equal and that some value systems are more worth defending than others. And that ISIS and what ISIS tends to stand for is, is morally abominable, right? Is morally reprehensible. Um, and, you know, 
this is not me equating, you know, uh, a condemnation of ISIS with a condemnation of Islam at all, right? In fact, what I've done very particularly is I picked this low-hanging fruit of this strange interpretation of the Islamic tradition. I could have just as readily talked about the way in which the Westboro Baptist Church is condemnable in some of its actions. They don't, I don't think that they're associated with terrorist actions and war in the same way that ISIS is. And so ISIS is an easier target, if you will, of condemnation. But we, you know, no particular religious tradition sort of has a monopoly on strange versions of it. And my point here entirely, right, if I recap it, is that the rise of the modern is going to give a uh, rise to kind of a challenge, what I'm going to call a modern crisis in ethics. And that is especially in the early modern as we develop physics and chemistry and biology into fields of their own and we are empowered by the knowledge that they produce, it's going to make moral values and morality as a whole more of a mystery than it's ever been before. The more we look at life through the lenses of our microscopes and our telescopes, the more we will understand hair follicles, hair follicles and, and, and the iris of the, and the eye, and we'll understand eventually atoms and molecules. And the more we look through telescopes, the more we're going to understand galaxies and stars. And this is all very empowering, but nowhere in between the atoms and the, and the galaxies just to use two simple sort of theoretical uh, thresholds, if you will, of the small and the large, the microcosm and the macrocosm, all of it, right, has been sort of more well explained than ever before by science. But nowhere in that do we find firm evidence for right and wrong, for good and evil. We see plenty of humans with opinions, Right? And so this leads to this crisis, which then leads to, I think, an over-willingness to go towards increasing forms of relativism. But now let's combine this with something we said earlier in, the, earlier in the lecture today, that if you look at the way I took the idea of Luther's Reformation as a kind of a symbolic moment, and I said that this is a good news story in many ways because it's going to lead to increasing, you know, sort of a favoritism of of uh, religious freedom. The other side of this, if we're honest, is that, you know, these religious institutions used to glue us together. And more and more, especially by the time we get to the 20th and 21st century, what we're going to see is this general trajectory that is true of all the religious traditions, this trajectory towards fragmentation of institutions leading ultimately to what seems like kind of a natural conclusion, which is individual level faith right, is good news for religious freedom, but bad news for the moral glue of society. And so is, in many respects, the rise of influence of science, right? It's good news in terms of the knowledge that it offers us and the way that we use that. But remember that the way that we use science is itself driven by the values of society. But science itself is going to show us that we understand the values of society less and less, and that's gonna lead many people to be considering individual or cultural level relativism as the most persuasive account of morality that we have, which is another version of fragmentation, right? And so much of this explains what we see in the 20th and 21st century in terms of the value systems of society, and the increasing challenges that we face, despite all the progress that we've been making in many ways, what we're seeing is a breakdown, uh, to use some postmodern language here, uh, you know, a breakdown of the master narratives, right? And in many respects, that's been progress, but in other respects, that's left a hole. That's left a mystery. And morality, you know, and, and let me just talk about ethics more broadly, both in terms of the ancient question of ethics, of, of what it makes a, good, a life worth living, and in terms of the, of the more modern moral question of how can we be good people. 
these are still incredibly practical and I would argue kind of fundamental questions that in a Socratic sense, we all ought to be asking. And we're more and more inclined in the 21st century, and I read this from my students all the time, to be very, you know, you know on a positive note, sort of tolerant to agree to disagree. But this is a problem for two reasons. Agreeing to disagree leads us to not find it valuable to join into Philia Sophia communities and pursue wisdom about being a human being. And that's a loss in the, in the late modern, arguably the postmodern 20th and 21st century. And the other loss here, right, is that we still need a value system to glue us together. And in many respects, right, like this problem is becoming increasingly acute as we've globalized as a species and as our economic structures have globalized. And, you know, we now see more than ever that we are completely interdependent on one another. How are we going to cooperate? Well, in some sense, the answer has got to include global level value systems. And that's terrifying to many people who have studied the challenging history of the you know, United Nations and the League of Nations before that. But in some sense, we have to continue towards a discourse at least about shared values because shared values are what undergird cooperation and cooperation will be what allow us to deal with the now global level problems ironically brought to you by the progress of the scientific age you know in many ways to go back to an idea that i brought out in my very first lecture in this series you know we live in a time where it's really obvious that our greatest existential threats are, you know, not necessarily meteor strikes anymore, but they're, you know, they're anthropogenic, right? You know, in some ways we're debating if this is the Anthropocene because we are so shaping the geological history of the planet that whether it's nuclear self-annihilation or the technological disruption of, of, our, of our economic structures or just ecological uh, degradation, right? Just to use three big existential threats that um, the contemporary writer and theorist Yuval Harari talks about in, in his books and work. You know, we're now confronting the fact that the sixth major extinction on the planet is underway and we're the meteor. <clears throat> and we're the meteor because we've become so powerful and we've become so powerful in part through science and technology you know technology is built out of this scientific understanding but if it's true what i've been developing for you that the dark side of this story is that science itself has fed into an increasing sort of undercutting of the moral structures of history obviously the divine command theoretical structures of the medieval and in many ways i've talked explicitly already about the undercutting of the natural law theories of morality including even the ongoing attempt to spread the idea of natural human rights i mean do the guys in guantanamo have natural human rights do the prisoners in guantanamo bay have natural human rights you know, I mean, maybe right there in your own hesitation, you can feel the tension of the modern age is that, you know, we love to talk a good game about human rights. But on the other hand, if you really press us as to whether we're committed to them, it's dubious. And we're quick to retreat to, well, they're not American citizens, so they don't get the same treatment, right? It, that you don't get it because we, in some sense, Many of us lack the philosophical history and the philosophical concepts um, and vocabulary to sort of talk about these big historical influences in this way, but it's gonna click in your brains because of the way in which these philosophical contexts and this philosophical history undergirds much of the moment in which you're living when you're still trying to figure out what, at, what to get out of bed for in the morning and how we're gonna do this together. When you're still trying to figure out the answers to the age old ethical questions of how can you be a good, how can you get the most out of life? 
and how can you be a good person? But you're doing it in an age where ironically that which has made us most powerful is in the process of undercutting our, the, the moral glue and value structures that used to serve to glue us together and bring us together into cooperative units. And so this is a case for a modern crisis in ethics, right? And I wanna finish the lecture today by developing for you another symbolic moment of the modern. A moment which I will, like I did in my development of the symbolic moment of the, of the Reformation of Martin Luther, I'm gonna to talk to you now about what we can call the Copernican Revolution within the history of science. And I wanna develop for you, this is a kind of a symbolic moment of again, the sort of good news and bad news of this story. Okay, so many of you are of course well aware of the scientific revolution that has transpired, uh, whereby we now you know, see it as commonsensical that the earth is not the center of the universe. Okay, but let me unpack for you a little bit more nuanced understanding. Some of you no doubt already have it, but let me just sort of get it out on the table for, for purposes of thought here. Um, in the early 16th century, using only his own naked eye, a cleric, a, a learned cleric, would be indulging in some of the methodological and systematic approaches that we would associate with science. And I'm talking here about Nicholas Copernicus, the Polish cleric, mathematician, and astronomer, and sort of polymath, right? Like this, like many of these early modern figures, just somebody really well informed on a lot of what we would think of as scientific debates. And using only the naked eye, Copernicus gives rebirth to an ancient idea uh, which the by this you know by this time the catholic church had taken a firm stand against and the reborn idea is sort of captured by this idea of the copernican revolution the revolution of copernicus was the bold idea that the earth is not the center of the universe that the sun is the center okay um, again, an idea that we can find uh, uh, precedence for in the ancient Greek world, but an idea that had long ago sort of been fallen by the wayside, but that will be reborn here in the modern, uh, in the work of Copernicus, but then will be echoed in the next century in the 17th by the Italian Galileo and by the Frenchman Descartes and you know, of course, Galileo is going to be called before the Inquisition over this issue. You know, that's how serious this is. Uh, I think that Descartes is going to withhold, if I recall, the publication of his treatise in defense of the Copernican theory, right? The, the heliocentric idea because of uh, hearing of the trouble that Galileo gets into. Um, but, but the point that's interesting there to, to highlight is that independently, right, individuals from different societies are going to look at the evidence, they're going to look at the star charts in the 16th and 17th century, and they're going to say, Houston, we got a problem here. The stars are not where they should be. Now look, everything I'm teaching you about, everything I'm lecturing about here kind of has a deeper, more complicated you know, story behind it. And, and that's the joy really of sort of being awakened to some of these intellectual ideas and these intellectual, th these theories, right, is that there's this incredible sort of depth here that it becomes sort of joyful to explore and to try to understand. But, but let me just give you a kind of a sketch of it. There were actually a lot of pretty powerful arguments for the earth being the center of the, of the universe. But right on the surface of it, I just want to draw your attention to how friggin' commonsensical it must have seemed to imagine that the earth was the center of everything. I mean, it looks like the sun rises and it looks like the sun sets and it looks like everything, if you watch the stars in the sky, it just looks like everything sort of goes around us. And if you're standing on the earth and you're not falling off of it, 
then it seems like you're probably on something flat and you're probably on something stable, right? Like you don't feel it moving. You certainly don't feel it spinning through space. I mean, think for a moment about how radical it would have been to claim that we are like standing, what would have been like sideways on a, on a sphere that is spinning. I mean, come on, every child knows what happens if you get on a merry-go-round and you let go, the force is gonna throw you off. How can you be on a sphere that is spinning? First of all, how can you stand on a sphere, on a sphere and not fall right off? And, you know, it won't be until the 17th century that we get a quantifiable understanding of the law of gravity. So, I mean, think how radical, right, a, more than a century or a century at least before, you know, you get to Newton's quantifiable understanding of law of gravitational attraction to claim that we are on a sphere that is spinning through space. Where's the wind, right? And why are we not falling off? And why does it certainly look, and, and of course, these are just the commonsensical arguments. There are actually some really good sort of more technical arguments for, as to why it seemed like the earth was the center and not the sun. However, in some sense, we know how this played out. You know, Copernicus is going to publish his findings pretty late in his life. And so while his books and writings will be banned, um, you know, he's not going to have time to be called to, before the Inquisition. Galileo, by the 1630s, will, right? Um, and so this is a real sort of you know, talk about a cultural tension, right? The church has invested in a geocentric model. Now, scripture itself doesn't speak to this very uh, directly. There are a lot of sort of indirect references that would lead one to believe that scripture has this more commonsensical idea of the ge of geocentric model. But, but, the issue, but the evidence offered by Copernicus, that which then <clears throat> enhanced in the work of Galileo, right? You may recall that Galileo is going to take this Dutch toy that's being developed into what will come to be known as the telescope, and he's going to use this to enhance his capacity to capture light and to study systematically the stars and to compare them to the old star charts and just to amass evidence against geocentrism and for heliocentrism. And then independent of Galileo, other thinkers are going to look at the same body of evidence and say, yeah, common sense and including the senses, and it seems so obvious, it's got to be wrong. It's got to be that we're going around the sun. Now, again, all of this in many ways I put back, I put on the table for you it is good news, right? Because we're coming to understand more. But let's start to flesh this out in terms of the crisis that this is going to contribute to. The more we know, in some Socratic sense, the more we're going we're gonna to realize how invested in some shadows we've been. And this shadow in particular, the shadow I'm going to call geocentrism, right? Like, this is going to lead Descartes to a kind of a radical, you know, philosophical move where he's going to become incredibly skeptical about everything he can become skeptical about. Why? Well, because if you can be wrong about how obvious it seems that the sun rises and the sun sets, then what else can you be wrong about? And now let's add not only this sort of it's going to foster a kind of a deep sense of skepticism. The more we know, the more it tells us how wrong we can be, right? And now add that this is going to be a major problem for the church, right? I think, um, you know, the church is going to banish the writings of Galileo and, the, you know, and uh, put Galileo on, on, on house arrest, right, in front of the, because he's called before the Inquisition, and he won't be forgiven for centuries. I mean, I forget, I think it's somebody in the 20th century that actually officially says, sorry, Galileo, you're, you were right. And, and, you know, I don't want to make light of this, because I'm developing it as a kind of a crisis, but this is going to impact church authority. If the church can be wrong about this, 
it, now again, this is going to take centuries for people to kind of come to grips with. But for people who are going to be literate and who are going to read these early findings of scientists because of the printing press, you know, for 18th century, I'm sorry, 17th century English thinkers like Thomas Hobbes, you know, when he reads, the more physics, chemistry, and biology he reads, the more he's going to move away from the conservative education that he gets at Oxford, and the more he's going to move towards this radical rethinking of everything. And that's why Thomas Hobbes, in the middle of the, uh, the middle of the 17th century, with his work Leviathan, is going to be considered by most to be sort of the first really important modern ethical uh, philosopher. Um, and I'm, that, that's just me foreshadowing. We'll come back to that in a, in a later lecture. But here what I'm developing for you is that Hobbes and others are going to see the bad news looming. Right. And, and in many ways, that's why Hobbes is the first modern, because he's the first to really wrestle systematically with the upsetting implications of this. The more we understand about the apparently big physical machine that is the universe, the more we're going to understand what we don't know that we thought we knew and understood before. And in particular, in this lecture series on the history of ethics, the more a mystery you know, ethics is going to be for us and morality is going to be for us. And now let's take this just one step further to wrap it up and, and sort of build on the Copernican revolution as a symbolic moment of the early modern and, and talk about how this is unpacks and develops in the later modern to sort of really get us to a kind of an understanding of this crisis in another way. Not only will the human rights and moral facts become a greater mystery. The whole idea that has been so influential in Western civilization that we are at the center of the universe, a creature made by the, by the divine source of all creation, capable of seeing the moral truth, this whole story is going to be increasingly upset by science, right? Especially by the time you get to like evolutionary biology in the 19th century, in the work of Darwin, which again is another reborn ancient Greek idea that then just gets sort of spelled out in a way and expanded in a way that becomes kind of undeniable and now serves as the, the basis, right, for all biology done these days, evolutionary biology. It's not perfect. There's still some things we can't explain. I get it, but that doesn't mean we reject the importance and explanatory power of evolutionary biology, but it's going to bring some bad news, right? Like Homo sapiens are not as sui generis as we thought. You know, Homo sapiens are not as unique as we believed for kind of commonsensical reasons. When we lived prior to a greater understanding of the fossil record, when we lived prior to a deeper understanding of evolution and, and, and genetics in particular, right, and the evolution of, of our genetics, the, you know, the, it, it was so obvious that we were like radically different from all the other animals. But that story itself is going to be eroded as we unpack, unpack the modern. And I've moved a little bit away from the Copernican revolution. Let's go back to that and talk about the way in which that unpacks to erode some in conceptions of ourselves and conceptions of reality, right? To impact metaphysics, which is going to change ethics. Right? And in particular, it turns out, right? Um, you may have caught this as I developed it, you know, in this way on purpose. Copernicus was right in a way, Galileo, Descartes, they were right in a way, and they were wrong in a major way too. The movement from geocentrism to the heliocentric model was progress, but the sun's not the center of the universe, right? The sun's the center of the sun system, the solar system, the star system that our planet Earth is a part of. And so, you know, the more we unpack this throughout the modern age, the more we're going to understand, yep, we are one planet amongst 
we thought nine, now eight, right? Turns out we didn't have a very good definition of planet. <laughs> and really it took to the 20th century to even realize that. And the more of a, of a hard definition of planet we tried to arrive at, the more I think Pluto gets the boot to, you know, sort of relegation to dwarf planet. And I'm saying that in kind of a joking way as we go from nine planets to, to eight. And we're not even a very big planet. Now look, I wouldn't want to have to mow the entire earth, right? Like there's a famous joke from a comedian that the earth, they say the, you know, it's a small earth after all, but I wouldn't want to paint it, right? I mean, but it's not a big planet, right? You know, the largest planet in the solar system is Jupiter. And um, you could fit about a thousand, maybe closer to 1200 or 1300 Earths inside of Jupiter. If you could hollow out Jupiter and just sort of replicate Earth, just to get a sense for scale here, right? Earth's not that big. Not only is it not central, it's not that big. And again, this story, listen to it, because that's where I'm going here. It's not central and it's not that big. And what is the understanding of this gonna do to the story that we have leaned upon for millennia, that we are a special creature at the center of everything with a special relationship to the cause of everything. Okay, so listen to this as we unfold the crisis, right? So it turns out that we're not the center, that we go around the sun, but we're not that big a planet. There are other planets, they look small. They only look small because they're so friggin' far away and it takes the light you know, a long time to get here, but we eventually capture it and that's how we get information about it. But the more we understand, the more we realize that the earth is not that big. You could put, let's just use a nice round number, a thousand earths inside Jupiter with room to spare. Okay, well you could put about a thousand Jupiters inside the sun which is our nearest star. A thousand Jupiters inside the sun. Well, that means you could put over a million Earths inside of a star like our sun. I mean, it, it's, we're getting to the point where like the national debt and macroeconomics in general, this is hard to even conceive of, right? Um, by the way, you know, small tangent, don't mistake macroeconomics for microeconomics. Scale matters, right? So, you know, just, just don't be overly simple in the way you look at the economies of nation states in relation to simple microeconomic ideas. Um, but with that said, I'm developing, you know, sort of physical scale ideas here because I'm developing a story of the modern crisis in ethics because of the way in which science impacts the metaphysics of the previous millennia, specifically in terms of our understanding of the reality outside of ourselves and our place, us, as a creature, as, a, as one species amongst many species, inhabiting a paint-thin layer of one planet amongst many planets, right? And not even that big a planet as we just developed. And let's, let's continue with that line of thought there just in terms of scale for a second. You know, it turns out that our sun, our star, is one star amongst hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy. And I hope I've got that right. I always doubt myself in this moment, right? Um, uh, in the galaxy, the Milky Way, there are hundreds of billions of suns, hundreds of billions of stars. And many, or maybe most, have planets circling them, right? Many, let's say, just to be conservative, right? And so the uniqueness of our location in space, right? Like this is beginning to collapse, as is our sense for sort of being the stable center uh, and, and somehow really significant within this larger context. Because not only are we one planet around one star amongst hundreds of billions of stars, that's in one galaxy. And how many galaxies are there? Well, we don't know because it's really hard to collect light from so far away, but so far there's hundreds of billions, there's billions of galaxies, billions with a B of galaxies as collections of, of stars. And, you know, going back to scale just for a second, you know, if you, 
go enough light years away and just dwell on that concept for a second if you travel the distance that light would travel in a year and i'm going to be you know kind of unfortunately american here and go with some standard you know uh, measurements in miles here off the top of my head i think light travels what like 180 something thousand miles 180 something thousand miles a second and one light year is how far light travels in a year and if you go enough light years away you can get to a large star like i think maybe antares or betelgeuse or something like that right both being large stars betelgeuse maybe being the nearest super star really large star and ask yourself the same question we've been asking how many of our suns our stars could you fit inside of something like uh betelgeuse right and you know you could put a million earths inside of our sun a thousand more than a thousand Earths inside of Jupiter, a thousand Jupiters inside the Sun. You know, maybe if you're following the logic here, you might see a thousand. You'd be closer to answering correctly if you said that you could put millions of our suns inside of a large sun, a large star. Now, look, astrophysics and astronomy is not my specialty here. But I'm developing what I hope is a generally accurate, and again, check me on all these if you want to, ideas, right? Never take anything for granted, especially on the internet, right? Have multiple sources. But, but if assuming that what I've told you is genuinely, uh, genu generally accurate, then what's unfolded in the modern age brought to you by science is a serious upsetting of our sense of ourselves as somehow located centrally in a way that makes it obvious that we're significant to the source of everything in a way that nothing else is. Now, let's also be clear about something. Science doesn't disprove the metaphysics, the teleological metaphysics of natural law. Science doesn't disprove revelation so science doesn't disprove divine command theory it doesn't disprove natural law theory but what it does is it explains reality exponentially better than anything we've ever had before without appealing to a teleological conception at all and without finding any evidence for what we might think of as miraculous revelation now are there things that are unexplained yes <laughs> but just to stay on that word for a second unexplained right so to argue from what we don't know or can't yet explain to some conclusion that therefore we are justified in thinking we have evidence for something like revelation is to commit the fallacy of the argument from ignorance now again let me be clear because i don't ever do this kind of lecture to be disrespectful none of this is to say that we can't meaningfully have faith in our lives but in some sense that's why it's called faith right and let's not mistake it for evidence-based and reason-based you know belief and so what we're seeing is that the physics and chemistry and the biology of the modern age is going to paint a picture of reality that just doesn't include these things that have been the foundation, the metaphysical foundations undergirding divine command theories of morality and natural law theories of morality. And whatever you decide in this increasingly fragmented 21st century, maybe postmodern moment, based on individual choices and individual kinds of faith-based experiences, we still need to figure out how we're gonna glue ourselves together. And so in some sense, right, like this is what the modern ethical theorists are gonna be up to. They are going to be informed enough, educated enough, thoughtful enough to have dived into all this stuff enough to understand 
that if we're going to find a value structure to glue ourselves together into large complex economies that facilitate the kind of cooperation that lead to safety and flourishing and ironically the ability to respond to the problems that we ourselves have created because we've become so powerful then we need to find convincing accounts of morality for the modern age i.e. to say it another way we need to find secular accounts of morality that are convincing and that are consistent with everything that we know in about uh, uh, ourselves and the universe in the modern age and so I hope you can see how the Copernican revolution and how that expands out into this greater understanding of, 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 of space uh, and time and our location within space and within time has been deeply, deeply disruptive of our age old sense of ourselves in relation to the universe and how that in many ways has disrupted our metaphysical conceptions, our conceptions of reality, which in this lecture series I've said it's always for, for ethics, for the sake of ethics, always been about what do you think about reality? What do you think about yourself? And the story of science has disrupted both in a major, major way. And in, in many respects, this produces what I've called the modern crisis in ethics. And that is a kind of a, a metaphysical crisis. How do we explain morality? if we take seriously the way we explain reality and just and and generate technologies in the modern age and if, if you don't quite grasp that i don't think you'll grasp the importance and the um, sort of radical significance of thinkers like hobbes and hume and kant and bentham and mill and the legacies that all of those modern thinkers have left in the discourse about ethics to this day. So that completes my lecture on the uh, rise of modern ethics and particularly my focus on the modern crisis in ethics, setting the stage for uh, the modern ethical theorists that we'll deal with in, um, in almost the remainder of this lecture series. Lecture, lecture series. I hope you're having a good day and uh, hope you're having a good life and I hope you're being good to one another. We'll talk more.